This is lecture 55D, uh, Qin's king becomes China's emperor. And as you know, we're, this is the uh, series ABCs of Communism, Bolshevism 2018, so you won't have the text of this book until next January, but uh, the lectures continue. And uh, I wanted to focus in on this particular area that you can see on your map, which is in North China in the Wang Ho Yellow River, in other words, region of China, where there were seven kingdoms which had settled out by 2,240 years ago. And by 2,221 years ago, this kingdom in gray, which is called Qin, Q-U-I-N, uh, conquered all of the others. And that's how China got its name, from Qin. And its first, its king was then the chi first Chinese emperor. Um, and uh, now we're going to go back to the lecture. And toward the end of the lecture, we're going to focus in on this area again. And uh, we'll take a closer look at, blow by blow, how Qin's king took over all of the others. We're going to begin with the Zhou Kingdom, that's spelled Z-H-O-U. Um, the Zhou Kingdom and the spring and autumn period, as it's known in Chinese history. And then we're going to move directly to the Seven Warring Kingdoms. The Zhou Dynasty, which began in 3046 BP, lasted until about 2256 BP, was the longest lasting dynasty, dynasty in Chinese history. By 2000 years ago, the Zhou Dynasty had begun to emerge in the Yellow River Valley. It began overrunning the territory of the Shang. This was the victory of the ruling class political grouping wishing to achieve labor peace via a feudal solution. That is, masters over slaves were to become masters over serfs. This was the idea at any rate when the Zhou Kingdom began. Chattel slavery modified was to give the slave families a modicum of the civil rights they had once enjoyed according to their own mythology and legends in far past times. It was a first experimentation with the looser discipline. The Zhou top dogs began their rule and conquered Shang lands by introducing a feudal system. The Zhou ruling families lived west of the Shang. Their leader, King Wu, W-U, had begun his career having been appointed by Shang boss Ling as the western protector. Then King Wu, with the assistance of his brother, the Duke of Zhou, managed to defeat the opposing Shang army set to secure his submission at the Battle of Muye. Now, the King of Zhou at this time invoked the concept of the Mandate of Heaven to legitimize his rule. This Confucian doctrine would be influential for every succeeding dynasty, at least until the kingdoms had been reduced to seven and the King of Xin, uh, S-H-I-N now, from which China gets its name, uh, decided Confucianism had to go with no ifs, ands, or buts, and he replaced Confucianism with the true doctrine of Chinese feudalism he called legalism. Then he conquered the other six slave-based kingdoms with his massive feudal serf army and modern weaponry. Accordingly, China went from slave kingdoms to feudal empire, the exact opposite in terms of polity from what had happened in Europe with the collapse of the Roman slave stage empire, and the rise of feudal serf fiefdoms there, but exactly the same process of sociocultural evolutionary stage slavery giving way in sociocultural evolutionary stage to feudalism. That is the story. For, uh, that is a story for later in this book. Anyway, the mythology of the doctrine, like that of all religions, is irrelevant to the reality of its sociocultural purpose of securing obedience of the masses. Nevertheless, some attributes of Confucianism are of interest to us. Heaven, or Tian, T-I-A-N, ruled over all the other gods, and it decided who would rule China. If ruler had lost the mandate of heaven, the proof might be that some natural disaster or false flag event had occurred. In reality, of course, what had happened was that one slavocrat faction had won out over some other one. The extant royal house would be overthrown, and a new house would rule, having been granted the mandate of heaven. Now, after mopping up the Shang armies, the Zhou initially moved their capital west to an area near modern Xi'an, X-I-A-N. Now, Xi'an is on the Wei River, W-E-I, which is a tributary of the Yellow River. Then the Zhou ruling progressive slavocrat families presided over a series of expansions into the Yangtze River Valley, 
uh, that's the Yellow River Valley, absorbing the farming populations there by placing a looser discipline upon them than had been customary in the preceding kingdoms. In the Iron Age in East Asia, um, which begins in China in 2600 BP, we have a uh, which begins at this particular time. This corresponds to the beginning of the spring and autumn period of Chinese history. Cast iron objects appeared in the Yangtze Valley by 2,600 years ago. These were found at Changsha and Nanjing. Guangdong burial suggests that the initial use of iron there occurred from about 2,350 BP. The technique used at Lingnan is a combination of bivalve molds of distinct southern traditions and the incorporation of peace mold technology from the Zongyuan. The products of the combination of these two periods are bells, vessels, weapons, ornaments, and a sophisticated cast. Now we begin the spring and autumn period, as it's called. In 2771 BP, the Quanrong invasion destroyed the western Zhou and its capital at Haojing. Now the Zhou king fled to the eastern Zhou capital of Luoyi. The event ushered in the Eastern Zhou Dynasty, which is divided into the Spring and Autumn and the Warring States periods. The Spring and Autumn period, 2771 to 2476 BP, corresponds to the first half of the Eastern Zhou period. The period's name derives from the Spring and Autumn Annals, a chronicle of the state of Lu, that is the Kingdom of Lu, between 2722 and 2479 BP, which tradition associates with Confucius. Now during this period, the ruling families of the various feudal polities of the Zhou system had, that had, the Zhou system had created challenged the authority of the Zhou kingship. More and more dukes and marquises demanded de facto regional autonomy. This was in defiance of the king's court in Luo Yi. Um, furthermore, their greed led them to wage war amongst themselves. Thus, during the spring and autumn period, China's loosening of the uh, discipline of Fengjian feudalism was undone. The Zhou court had lost its homeland in the Guangzhou region and held only nominal power. Real power was in the hands of the wealthy families whose riches had been gained by the utility of the Fengjian system they now wished to abolish. During the early part of the Zhou dynasty period, royal relatives and generals had been given control over fiefdoms in an effort to maintain Zhou authority over vast territory. Edgar Kaiser and Young Kai wrote the key article on this in 2003 called War and Bureaucratization in Qin, China, exploring an anomalous case in the American Sociological Review, Volume 68. And give the full reference citations there, of course. Anyway, as the power of the Zhou kings waned, subordinate fiefdoms became increasingly independent kingdoms. And then we had the Magna Carta of slaveholding lords. The most important emergent kingdoms, calling themselves the Twelve Equals, came together in regular conferences where they decided important matters amongst themselves. Included were, of course, military expeditions against other kingdoms and against upstart nobles. During these sit-downs, one participant might be declared the hegemon in charge. As the era continued, larger and more powerful kingdoms annexed or claimed suzerainty over smaller ones, so that by 2400 BP, most small polities had disappeared, leaving a few large kingdoms to dominate nuclear China. The southern kingdoms of Chu and Wu claimed independence from the Zhou. In turn, Wu and Yue undertook wars against them. Out of the ashes, amid the inter-kingdom power struggles, Internal conflict to each was rife. For example, six of the richest land-holding families waged war on each other inside the kingdom of Jin, J-I-N. In addition, political enemies set about eliminating the Chen family in the kingdom of Qi, Q-I. In all these cases, the fighting was between greedy families, such as the royal family members in Qin and Chu, which coveted the slave labor of their neighbors. Once all these powerful rulers had firmly established themselves within their respective domains, the bloodshed settled into internecine warfare between the big seven kingdoms. Thus began the Warring States period in 2403 BP, when the three remaining elite families in Jin, Zhao, Wei, and Han, partitioned that kingdom. And so we begin the era in ancient Chinese history of warring kingdoms popularly referred to as the Warring States period, 
which followed the spring and autumn period. The Warring States period derived its name from the Record of the Warring States, a book compiled early in the Han Dynasty, uh, soon by Sima Qian, whose choice of 2475 BP is generally the most often cited and popularly, popularly accepted beginning date. The Warring Kingdoms period also overlaps with the second half of the Eastern Zhou Dynasty. However, the King of Zhou ruled merely as a figurehead against the backdrop of internecine machinations of the Seven Kingdoms at War. The period concluded with the Kingdom of Qin conquest that witnessed its annexation of the other six contending kingdoms in 221 BP, which is commonly thought of as 221 BC in the old literature, China was thus unified. The first dynasty of the Chinese Empire was accordingly the Qin Dynasty. And you'll, you'll, if you stop and think about it, you realize in 221 BC, the Roman Republic was still very much in the process of formation. Now, the political geography of the era was dominated by the seven warring states. First of all, we had Qin. The, the uh, Kingdom of Qin was in the far west. Its core was in the Wei River Valley, W-E-I, and Guangzhou. This geographical position offered protection from the states of the Central Plains, but limited its initial influence, and it's shown in gray on our map. Uh, on the other hand, in the event, it provided Prime Minister Sheng the time he needed to build his country's modern new model army and to propagate and win over the ruling landowners to his preferred ideology of legalism. Legalism offered both landowners and the land-attached laborers labor peace. It did this by ensuring both classes of um, certain legal rights, which effectively transformed slaves into what Europeans call serfs. Then we have the three Jins, that is northeast of, Xin, of, of the kingdom of uh, Qin on the Shanxi Plateau were the three successor states of Jin, and they were Han, south along the Yellow River, controlling the eastern approaches to Xin, we on the middle Yellow River, and, Z and Zhou, Zhao, um, Z-H-A-O in other words, the northernmost of the three. Then there was the Kingdom of Qi, Q-I, located in the east of China, centered on the Shandong Peninsula, east of Mount Tai, with territory extending throughout the peninsula and into adjacent lands, and the Kingdom of Chu, C-H-U, located in the south of China with its core territories around the valleys of the Han River, and later the Yangtze River, and the Kingdom of Yan, Y-A-N, located in the northeast, centered on modern-day Beijing. Late in the period, Yan pushed northeast and began to occupy the Liaodong Peninsula. Besides these seven major states, some minor states also survived into the period. Among them were the Yue, Y-U-E, on the southeast coast near Shanghai, uh, which was highly active in the late spring and autumn era, but was eventually annexed by Chu. And Sichuan, C-I-C-H-U-A-N, in the far southwest, where the kingdoms of Ba and Shu were located. Qin conquered these non-Chu kingdoms late in the period, and in the central plains comprising much of modern-day Hidan province, Many smaller city-state kingdoms survived as satellites of the larger polities, though they were eventually to be absorbed as well. And finally, Zongshan, between the kingdoms of Zhao and Yan, um, which was annexed by Zhao in 2296 BP. Now, as for periodization, the spring and autumn period was initiated by the eastward flight of the Zhou court. The political situation of the period was, culminated, was culm a culmination of historical trends of conquest and annexation which characterized the spring and autumn period. There is no one single incident or starting point for the Warring States era, but these starting points range from 2481 BP to 2403 BP. The system of feudal states created by the Western Zhou Dynasty underwent enormous change after 2771 BP with the flight of the Zhou court to modern-day Luoyang and the diminution of its relevance and power. The spring and autumn period led to a few states gaining power at the expense of many others no longer able to depend on a central authority for legitimacy or protection. During the Warring Kingdoms period, 
many rulers claimed the mandate of heaven to justify their conquest of other states and spread their influence. The struggle for hegemony eventually created a kingdom-state system dominated by several large kingdoms such as Jin, Chu, Qin, and Qi. The smaller states of the central plains uh, were forced into spheres of tribute-paying dependency. In addition to Jin, Chu, Qin, and Qi, the other major states were Wu and Yue in the southeast. The last decades of the spring and autumn era witnessed increased stability as peace negotiations between Jin and Chu had established their respective spheres of influence. However, the greed of the ruling landowning families brought instability again with the partition of the kingdom of Jin. Jin was divided between the houses of Han, Zhou, and Wei. This created the political geography of the seven major warring states which we just looked at at the beginning of this lecture and we will look at again at the end. The partition of the Kingdom of Jin was occurred between 2453 and 2403 BP. During that half century, the rulers of Jin steadily lost political power through their nominally subordinate nobles and military commanders. This situation arose from collapse of their tradition that had forbade the granting of land and its attached slave workers to the relatives of a ducal house. The idea had been to allow whatever families who had become big bosses to gain fiefs and hold them with armed force. Anyway, decades of internecine dogfighting led to four major families at the top of the heap. These were the Han, Zhou, Wei, and Zi. The Battle of Jinyang in 2453 BP saw the allied Han, Zhou, and Wei families destroyed the Ji family principality within the Jin kingdom. The Ji lands were distributed among the victors, and with this they became de facto rulers of most of Jin's territory. The Jin division created a political vacuum that enabled the first 50 years of Chu and Yue expansion northward and Qi southward. Meanwhile, the Qin family dictatorship increased its control over the local tribes of their kingdom and began their expansion southwest to Sikwan. The three Jins recognized 2403 to 2364 BP by the Zhou court under King Wei Li officially declared Zhao, Wei, and Han as subordinate allied bosses and allowed them the same rights as the other kingdoms. From 2403 until 2383, these three Jin kingdoms were united under the leadership of Wei bosses and expanded in all directions. The most important boss of Wei was the Marcus Wen, who ruled over the unruly, and in the War of 2408 and 20 to 2406, that two-year war, he conquered the kingdom of Zongshan to the northeast on the other side of Zhou. At the same time, he pushed west across the Yellow River to the Luo River, taking the area of Shihei. And then there was another dogfight. The growing power of Wei led the wary Zhao rulers to back away from the alliance, in 2383 BP, they moved their capital to Handan and attacked the small state of Wei, W-E-Y. Wei appealed, uh, appealed to Wei for assistance, and Wei responded with an attack on Zhao's west. In turn, Zhao called on Chu for help. Chu's price was the seizure of the territory to its north. However, the Allies agreed to allow Zhao to occupy a part of Wei. This conflict marked the end of the power of the United Jin's and the beginning of a period of shifting alliances and wars on several fronts. Now in 2376 BP, the states of Han, Wei, and Zhao deposed Duke Jing of Jin and divided the last remaining ter Jin territory between themselves. And this marks the end of the Jin kingdom. In 2370 BP, seven years later, Marcus Wu of Wei died without naming his successor. This led to a three-year war of succession. Then the Zhao bosses moved from the north in a deal with their Han counterparts who attacked Wei from the south. The greed of the leaders of Zhao and Han had led them to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. Both armies abruptly retreated. And seizing the moment, the boss of Wei, Marcus Hui, was able to become king of Wei, taking the credit for defeating Zhao and Han. In other words, the Latifundista rulers of the mass of slave labor acceded to their new savior. By the end of the period, Zhao extended from the Shanxi Plateau across the plains to the borders of Qi. We reached east to Qi, Lu, and Song, 
To the south, the weaker kingdom of Han held the east-west part of the Yellow River Valley, surrounded by the Zhou royal domain at Luoyang and an area north of Luoyang called Shangdang. The Qi resurgence under Tian 2379-2340 BP began when Duke Kang of Qi died in 2379 BP with no heir from the House of Jiang, which had ruled Qi since the kingdom's founding. The throne passed to the future King Wei from the House of Tian. The Tian had been very influential at court towards the end of Jiang rule, and they now assumed power. The new ruler set about reclaiming territories that had been lost to other kingdoms. He launched a successful campaign against the Zhao, Wei, and Wei, extending Qi territory to the Great Wolf. Sima Qian writes that the other kingdoms were so awestruck that nobody dared attack Qi for more than 20 years. The demonstrated military prowess also had a calming effect on Qi's own population, which experienced great domestic tranquility during Wei's reign. It demonstrated to the rulers of Qin that modernization along the lines of what the British would eventually call their new model army of Oliver Cromwell could give a kingdom the necessary military power to persevere over all enemies, foreign and domestic. By the end of King Wei's reign, Qi had become the strongest of the kingdoms. It proclaimed itself an independent kingship from the Zhou dynasty. Now, the wars of the Wei began when King Wei Hui of Wei, 2370-2319 BP, set about restoring the kingdom. Furthermore, he rationalized his frontiers with his neighbors in 2362-2359 to by exchanging territories with Han and Zhou. In 2365, Qin, at the Battle of Shimen, defeated uh, Wei, but by securing the intervention of Zhao, Qin prevailed. Qin won another victory in 2362 BP, so in 2361 BP, the Wei capital was moved east to Daliang to be secure from Qin. If anyone had been paying attention, the handwriting was on the wall. In 2354 BP, King Hui of Wei started a large-scale attack on Zhao. By 2353 BP, Zhao was losing badly, and its capital, Handan, was under siege. The state of Qi intervened. The famous Qi strategist Sun Bin, the great-great-great-grandson of Sun Tzu, author of The Art of War, designed a successful attack on the Wei capital while the Wei army was tied up besieging Zhou. The Wei army hastily moved south to protect its capital and, like the Nazis many years later, walked into a career-ending military trap. In this event, the Wei army was caught on the road and decisively defeated at the Battle of Giling. The battle is remembered in the second of the 36 stratagems book. Besiege we save Zhao, meaning to attack a vulnerable spot, to relieve pressure at another point. Domestically, King Hui patronized philosophy and the arts, and I think he is undoubtedly best remembered for sponsoring the Confucian philosopher Meng Zi. The slaveholding justifications of Confucius were of great importance to the then ruling classes of six of the kingdoms. The fact that North Americans think of their other pithy comments of Confucius as his important contributions is simply comment on their ignorance, and also of the Communist Party's recognition that gringo ignorance can be made into opportunity with their Confucian society. In Chinese language and thought, crisis and opportunity are the two sides of the same term, or coin if you prefer. The Dukes of Qi and Wei became kings in 344 B.C. or 2344 B.P. Figurehead rulers of the Zhou dynasty held the title of king, while the rulers of most kingdoms held the title of duke or marquis. A major exception was Chu, whose uh, rulers were called kings, since the king, of Wu, king Wu of Chu started using that title in 2703 B.P. In 2344 BP, the Dukes of Qi and Wei mutually recognized each other as kings. King Wei of Qi and King Hui of Wei declared their polities as kingdoms independent from the Zhou court. Simultaneously, they were denying Zhou or anyone else the mandate of heaven. Unlike the bosses of the spring and autumn period, this new generation of top dogs ascending thrones in the warring states period had abandoned the pretense of being vassals. 
Now, Sheng Yang imposes legalism on Qin, 2356 to 2338 BP. As we have seen during the early part of this period, Qin generally avoided conflicts with the other kingdoms. Qin had brought the time to build its new bought the time to build its new model army and achieve unity of its ruling classes in favor of legalism to ensure labor peace. Duke Xiao appointed Shang Yang as his prime minister to carry out these tasks. Shang centralized authority in accordance with legalist philosophy between the two decades 2358 to 2338 BP. Qin emerged with a technically superior army with steel armored infantry and dragoons supported by automatic crossbow fire, the latter well illustrated in the Mummy 3 movie. However, Qin's social reorganization guaranteed the new model army its unstoppable ultimate victories. The Prime Minister privatized land and rewarded farmers who exceeded harvest quotas and granted specifically defined rights to previously enslaved farmers. From that time farmers forward, the only farmers to be enslaved were those who failed to meet their quotas. Shang used these enslaved as rewards for landowners who met government policies. Manpower was short in Qin, and the Prime Minister enacted policies to increase its manpower by recruiting farmer peasants into the army, French Revolution, and Bonaparte style. To defend their newly won rights, they would have to send some sons to the army. Shank encouraged def defection of peasants from the other kingdoms. This immigration quickly solved Qin's labor shortage. Simultaneously, the PM had increased the manpower available to Qin's generals and weakened the economic base and conscription possibilities of Qin's coming enemies. Not satisfied with raiding for manpower, Shang's laws encouraged citizens to marry at a young age. His tax breaks were designed to encourage raising multiple children. He set about the freeing of convicts who volunteered to work opening wastelands for army granaries. And Shang abolished first son inheritance of a family's farm and created the double tax on households that had more than one son living in the household. He broke up the large clans into nuclear families. <coughs> this made the agricultural base easily managed, and the PM then moved the capital situating it to reduce the influence of nobles. In 2343 BP, the Zhou King conferred the title of hegemon on Duke Zhao. As was customary for the designated hegemon, the Duke hosted a conference of all of the feudal, feudal lords, although it did not lead to any lasting peace. It was clear to all that the royal regime was desperately trying to hold on to what was left of its now largely fairy tale reign much as the gringo bosses are today. Accordingly, Qin became much more aggressive. In 2340, Qin took land from Wei under, after it had been defeated by Qi. In 2316, Qin conquered Shu and Ba in Sikwan to the southwest. Development of this area added greatly to Qin's wealth and power. Wei defeated by Qin in 2341 to 2340 BP, in 2341, we attacked Han. Qi allowed Han to be nearly defeated and then intervened. The generals from the Battle of Guiling met again, Sun Bin and Tianji versus Pang Zhuan. By using the same tactic, attacking Wei's capital, Sun Bin feigned a retreat. He then turned on the overconfident Wei troops and decisively defeated them at the Battle of Meiling. After the battle, all three of the Jin successor kingdoms surrendered to King Zhuan of Qi. In 2340, Qin attacked and easily defeated the Wei Kingdom, which ended, which ceded a large part of its territory in return for peace. With Wei severely weakened, Qi and Qin became the dominant states in China. The way had been cleared for the final battles to unify nuclear China. Wei's last gap came, gasp came in the form of begging Qi for protection. King Hui of Wei met King Zhuan of Qi. After Hui's death, his successor, King Jiang, continued the special relationship with his Qi counterpart. Much like the UK and Gringolandia today, both promised everything to the other. Chu conquered Yue in 2334 BP. Early in the Warring States period, Chu was the strongest kingdom in China, rising to its peak in 2389 BP when King Dao of Chu named the famous reformer 
Wu Qi as his chancellor. Yue prepared to attack Qi to its north. The king of Qi sent an emissary who persuaded the king of Yue to attack Chu instead. Yue initiated a large-scale attack at Chu, and that attack failed. In 2334 BP, Chu conquered Yue to its east on the Pacific coast. Now, the dukes of Qin, Han, and Yan became kings in 2325 to 2323 BP. King Xi'an of Zhou had attempted to use what little royal prerogative he had left by appointing Han Duke Xi'an, Yan Duke Chiao, and Qin Duke Hui as hegemons. In royal fantasy theory, this made Qin a chief ally of the royal Zhou court. However, in 2325, the confidence of Duke Hui grew so great that he proclaimed himself King of Qin, thus adopting the same title as the King of Zhou, and thereby effectively proclaiming independence from the Zhou dynasty. King Hui of Qin was guided by his Prime Minister Zhang Yi, a prominent person of the legalist school of diplomacy. In 2323 BP, the other former dukes, now hegemons, did the same. King Hui of Han, King Yi of Yan, as did King Kuo of the minor kingdom of Zhongshan. In 2318 BP, even the ruler of Song, a relatively minor kingdom, declared himself a king. Now, petition of Zhou 2314 BP occurred when King Zhao of Zhou had enfeoffed his younger brother as Duke Huan of Henan. Three generations later, this cadet branch of the royal house began calling themselves the Dukes of East Zhou. Upon the ascension of King Nan in 2314 BP, East Zhou became an independent kingdom. The Zhou king took up residence in West Zhou. Now we have the horizontal and vertical alliances that, which occurred during the periods of 330, 2334 to 2249 BP or 334 to 249 BC. Towards the end of the Warring States period, the Qin Kingdom became disproportionately powerful compared with the other six. Therefore, the policies of the other six kingdoms finally focused on dealing with their common threat. In this, there were two schools of strategic thought. One school advocated a vertical or north-south alliance called Hezong, in which all six kingdoms would ally with each other to repel Qin. The other school advocated a horizontal or east-west alliance called Lianhing, in which one kingdom would ally with Qin to appease Qin's ascendancy. They were the hawks and doves of their time. Fracturing as Qin agents fostered mutual suspicions between the allies soon followed initial Hizong successes. Qin had an excellent intelligence and strategic services force. Having destroyed the vertical alliance, it began successfully undermining the horizontal alliance strategy. Thus, the six kingdoms were led to defeat one by one. Su Qin and the vertical alliance of 2334 to 2300 BP is something we want now to take a closer look at. Beginning in 2334 BP, the diplomat Su Qin spent years visiting the courts of Yan, Zhao, Han, Wei, Qi, and Chu, and persuaded them all to form a united front against Qin. In 2318 BP, all the kingdoms except Qi launched a joint attack on Qin. Qin's new model army made mincemeat out of their combined force. King Hui of Qin died in 2311 BP, followed by Prime Minister Zhang Yi one year later. The new monarch, King Wu, reigned only four years before he died under mysterious circumstances, and without heirs. Qin spies had engineered the chaos uh, which continued throughout 2307. Then a son of King Huey by a concubine, that is a younger half-brother of King Wu, could be established as king. After the failure of the first vertical alliance, Su Qin eventually came to live in Qi. There he was favored by King Chuan only to be subject to an assassination attempt in 2300 BP. Su was mortally wounded, but not dead. Attempting to draw out the assassins, sponsors, King Min concocted a plot and killed Su Qin, putting an end to the first generation of vertical alliance thinkers. Now, the first horizontal alliance occurred between 2300 and 2287 BP. King Min of Qi collaborated with Lord Meng Cheng, 
a grandson of the former King Wei of Qi, to make a westward alliance with the states of Wei and Han. In the far west, Qin, which had been weakened by a succession struggle in 2307, yielded to the new coalition and appointed Lord Meng Chang, its chief minister. A Qin princess marrying King Min sealed the alliance between Qin and Qi. This horizontal or east-west alliance secured peace for the moment. Left out was the kingdom of Zhao. Now around 2299 BP, the ruler of Zhao became the last of the seven major states to proclaim himself king. In 2398 BP, Zhao offered Qin an alliance, and Lord Meng Chang was driven out of Qin. The remaining three allies, Qi, Wei, and Han, attacked Qin, driving up the Yellow River below Shanxi to the Hanggu Pass. After three years of fighting, they took the pass and forced Qin to return territory to Han and Wei. They inflicted major defeats on Yan and Chu. During the five-year administration of Lord Meng Chang, Qi was the major power in China. Then in 2294 BP, Lord Meng Chang was implicated in a coup d'etat and fled to Wei. His alliance system collapsed. Qi and Qin made a truce and pursued their own interests. Qi moved south against the state of Song, whilst the Qin general Bai, Qi, Bai Qi pushed back eastward against the Hanwei alliance, gaining victory at the Battle of Yuke. In 2288 BP, King Zhao of Qin and King Min of Qi took the title Dai, or Emperor, of the West and East, respectively. The new allies started planning an attack on Zhao. Su Dei and the Second Vertical Alliance In 2287 BP, Su Dei, the younger brother of Su Qin and a secret agent of Yan, persuaded King Min that the Zhao War would only benefit Qin. King Min agreed and formed a vertical alliance with the other kingdoms against Qin. Qin backed off, abandoning the presumptuous title of Dai, and restored territory to Wei and Zhao. In 2286, Qi annexed the state of Zong. Then we had the Second Horizontal Alliance, which began in 2285 BP. The success of Qi had frightened the other kingdoms. Under the leadership of Lord Ming Chang, who was in exile at Wei, Qin, Zhao, and Wei, and Yan formed an alliance. Yan had normally been a relatively weak ally of Qi, and Qi feared little from this quarter. Yan's onslaught under General Yue Yi came as a, surprise, a devastating surprise. Simultaneously, the other allies attacked from the west. Chu declared itself an ally of Qi, but contented itself with annexing some territory to its north. Qi's armies were destroyed, while the territory of Qi was reduced to the two cities of Ju and Jimo. King Min himself was later captured and executed by his own followers. King Chiang in 2283 BP succeeded King Min. His general, Tian Dan, was eventually able to restore much of Qi's territory, but it never regained the influence it had under King Min. Now, Qin versus Zhao, 2278 to 2260 BP. General Bai Qi of Qin attacked from Qin's new territory in Sichuan to the west of Chu. The capital of Yang was captured, and Chu's western lands on the Han River were lost. The effect was to shift the Chu kingdom significantly to the east. After Chu was defeated in 2278, the remaining great powers were Qin in the west and Zhao in the north center. There was little room for diplomatic maneuver, and matters were decided by war in 2265 to 2260. Zhao had been strengthened by King Wu Ling of Zhao. Uh, in 2307, he, his enlarged cavalry, he enlarged his cavalry by copying the dragoon and cavalry forces of Qin. In 2306, he took more land in the northern Shanxi Plateau. In 2305, he defeated the northeastern border kingdom of Zongshan. In 2304, he pushed far to the northwest and occupied the east-west section of the Yellow River in the north of the Ordos Loop. King Huey Wen of Zhao chose able servants and expanded against the weakened Qi and Wei. In 2296, his general Lian Po defeated two Qin armies. In 2269, Fan Sui became chief advisor to Qin. He perfected army discipline 
committed the army to irrevocable expansion and forged an alliance with distant kingdoms to attack nearby enemies. This followed the 23rd of the 36 stratagems. His maxim, attack not only the territory but also the people, announced a policy of total war. <coughs> In 2265, King Zhao Shang of Qin kicked off the new war by attacking the weak kingdom of Han, which held the Yellow River Gateway into Qin. He moved northeast across Wei territory to cut off the Han enclave of Shandang north of Luoyang and the south of Zhao. The Han king feigned that he would surrender Shandang, but for the local governor who, he said, refused, and in the meantime he bestowed Shandang upon the king Zhao Chang of Zhao. Zhao sent out Lin Pi, uh, Lian Pao, who paced his armies at Changping. Qin sent out General Wang He. Lian Po was too wise to risk a decisive battle with the Qin army and remained inside his fortifications. In the event, Qin could not break them. The armies were locked in a stalemate for three years. The Zhao king, having decided that Lian Po was not aggressive enough, switched commanders and sent out General Zhao Kuo, who promised a decisive battle. Qin secretly replaced his general, Wang He, with the notoriously violent general Bai Qi. Bai Qi. <laughs> when Zhao Kuo left his fortifications, Bao Qi used a canne maneuver, that is, falling back in the center and surrounding the Zhao army from the sides. After being surrounded for 46 days, the starving Zhao troops surrendered in September 2260. Bai Qi had all the prisoners killed, so that Zhao lost 400,000 men and was permanently crippled. Qin sent an army to besiege Zhao capital, but the exhausted Qin army was defeated when it was attacked from the rear. Thus, Zhao survived barely. Now there was no longer a kingdom that could resist Qin on its own. The other states could have survived if they remained united against Qin, but they did not. The end of the Zhou dynasty became in the years 2256 to 2249 BP. The forces of King Zhao of Qin defeated King Nan of Zhou and conquered West Zhou in 2256 BP, claiming the Nine Cauldrons and thereby symbolically becoming the Son of Heaven. King Zhao's exceptionally long reign ended in 2251 BP. His son, King Zhao Wen, already an old man, died just three days after his coronation and was succeeded by his son, King Zhangqing of Qin. The new Qin king proceeded to conquer East Zhou seven years after the fall of West Zhou. Thus, the 800-year Zhou dynasty, nominally China's longest ruling regime, finally ended. Now, King Zhen of Qin unites China in the years 2247 to 22 BP. And at this point, we're going to stop for a moment so we can switch the camera to the a map. The kingdom we want to pay most attention to to begin with is the kingdom in gray, uh, which is called Qin, Q-I-N. And we're talking about King Zhen, King Zhen of Qin, who's going to unify China in the years 2247 to 2221 BP. Now, King Zongchang of Qin ruled for only three years. His son, Zhang, who, unlike the two elderly kings that preceded him, was only 13 years old at his coronation. Now, as an adult, Zheng would turn out to be a brilliant commander who, in the span of just nine years, achieved what all his predecessors had failed to do, the unification of China. Now, the other six kingdoms you're going to see here in different colors that uh, kind of make it clear which one is which. In 2230 BP, Qin conquered Han, that was the weakest of the seven warring kingdoms and adjacent to the much stronger Qin. Okay, now, the takeover had been well practiced in the war colleges of Qin and went much as the, as the Nazi onslaught against Poland would many centuries later. When Emperor Qi Shi Wang sent General Wang Jian to attack Zhou, the frightened King An of Han surrendered his entire kingdom without a fight, thus saving himself from execution and the Han populace from the terrible potential consequences of unsuccessful resistance. Then he turned his attention to the kingdom of Wei, W-E-I. In 2225 BP, Qin conquered Wei, 
the Qin army led a direct invasion into Wei by besieging its capital, Daliang. Now, Daliang city walls were too tough to make practical, so the Qin generals devised a new strategy in which they used the power of a local river linked to the Yellow River. Now, the river was used to flood the city's walls. It successfully breached the walls and caused massive devastation to the city so that King Jia of Wei hurriedly surrendered his capital to the Qin army. Now Qin turned its attention to the conquest of Chu. In 2223 BP, Qin conquered Chu after General Wang Jian was recalled to lead a second invasion with 600,000 men. The Chu forces were content to sit back and defend against what they expected to be a siege. However, Wang Jian decided to weaken Chu's resolve and tricked the Chu army by appearing to be idle in his fortifications while secretly training his troops to fight in Chu territory. After a year, the Chu defenders decided to disband due to apparent lack of action from the Qin. Wang Jian attacked at that point with full force and overran Hu Yang and the remaining Chu forces. So in 2223, General Wang captured So Chun and killed its leader, Lord Chang Ping. At their peak, the combined armies of Chu and Qi involved more than a million soldiers, more than those involved in the campaign of Chang Ping between Qin and Zhao 35 years later. Now, and just as a matter of interest, you can compare that to Roman armies that never amounted to anything that large. Now, the conquest of Zhao and Yan uh, began next in 2222. Qin conquered Zhao and Yan. After the conquest of Zhao, the Qin army turned its attention to Yan. And then in 2221 BP, Qin conquered Qi. Qi was the final unconquered warring state. It had not previously contributed, contributed or helped other kingdoms when Qin conquered them. And as soon as Qin's intention to invade it became clear, Qi swiftly surrendered, surrendered all its cities, completing the unification of China <coughs> and ushering in the Qin dynasty. The last Qi king lived out his days in exile in Gong. The Qin king Zhang declared himself Qin Shi Wang Di, the first sovereign emperor of Qin. The Qin imposed regime was based solely on military power. The feudal holdings were abolished and noble families were forced to live <coughs> in the capital of China. Xian Chang and uh, of Xianchang in order to be supervised. A national road as well as greater use of canals was used to deploy and supply the army and so that that could be done with ease and with speed. The peasant farmers were given a wider range of rights in regard to land although they were subject to taxation and they responded favorably by creating a large amount of revenue for the government. And that brings us to the end of this particular lecture and I think you get, a, you get the picture that we've been trying to build here. I want to make a, one final comment. I can't emphasize too strongly that in Marxist theory, slavery transforms to capitalism through an intermediate stage of feudalism that's halfway house between the two. In uh, the anti-communist theoreticians or historians, of which there are plenty in this country, have uh, used to make a big point out of the fact that, well, it, this has to be wrong because uh, the, there is no duplication of the disintegration of the Roman Empire into fiefdoms in China. But the important thing in China is not the political form of the transformation, but the fact that slavery went down and feudalism came up with the creation of the Chinese Empire. So it's the exact opposite of what happened in Europe in terms of political structure, but it's exactly the same in sociocultural evolutionary terms. So as usual, Marx and Engels were completely right. So with that comment, I think we'll just conclude for today. And in the next lectures on China, we're going to continue up through the period of the empire itself.